10 days and then, then heading out to uh, Albania. So uh, uh, busy late summer for me. Albania sounds great. Wow. Um, I'm going to attend Unfinished in Bucharest in a couple of weeks. So great. I will be n nearby. I'll throw a pebble across the border toward you. Yeah. Yeah. We can wave at each other. <laughs> Uh, the great wall separating Albania from the rest of the world is down, uh, but I don't think it's been discovered by uh, cheap flights from England yet, so I'm hoping that there's still uh, some uh, authentic uh, Albanian uh, experiences to be had. Mm -hmm. And thanks to you and Leif, I will be speaking also in Kaunas, Latvia, yes. at a business school conference there about stuff that's kind of fun. So, Excellent. Yeah, Kaunas is a nice town. I think you'll enjoy it. I think so, too. I'll put a link to the conference in the chat right now. Yeah, good. Um, how is everybody else? Good. Good. Um, Ken, how are your feet? Ken, better. Excellent. Slowly, slowly. Good, good. Glad to hear it. Um, so today is a check-in format, and um, I think people will gather in as we gather in. It's nice to see everyone. Um, Gil's phantom note taker has shown up, <clears throat> so I assume Gil, Gil will be trailing right after. Sort of like having a, a scout who beats the bushes out ahead of you to flush game. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, good. And Jesse's joining. Uh, so why don't we, uh, Hank, it's been a while since you've been here, but you know the routine. Why don't we go Hank, Barry, Ken for check-ins? Okay. Uh, well, I've been away for some time, but uh, that doesn't mean that... Uh, uh, my attempts to make the world a better place have stood still. Uh, I am uh, involved with uh, a uh, group from the five Nordic countries who are planning uh, a kind of working conference uh, next year in Reykjavik about the future or the futures of Nordic democracy. Uh, and uh, that embedded in the context of the futures of democracy in general. And we'll be probably using a kind of interactive positive cartography format for shaping uh, this working conference. There'll be people from the five Nordics and uh, other countries uh, involved. Uh, it will be at the moment uh, uh, an on-site face-to-face. We're looking at somewhere between 60 and 80 people. And uh, not that we want to answer the questions in advance, but what the uh, program committee is probably going to suggest as a good outcome from the conference so, uh, are a series of uh, new generation future centers and future labs as we're calling them at the moment uh, within different parts of each of the five Nordics and linked together so that uh, there'll be a maximum possibility of consulting uh, uh, citizens and residents of all types about how they want uh, democracy to develop. Uh, that's not the only thing I'm working on, but it's uh, something that's coming up uh, soon. I've got another working uh, uh, work meeting on that this coming Monday. Um, in preparation for that, I took part in a uh, one and a half hour Nesta program uh, about the futures of online democracy uh, with uh, more than 300 people from all over the world taking part. That was last Tuesday. And I was very disappointed to discover there's nothing new going on. Uh, they are dealing with how to leverage collective intelligence through uh, IT. Uh, no mention of the metaverse or the betaverse. Uh, 
talking about activities that have been known and tried out at least the last 10 years. So a bit disappointing in that. And they still find that the best input for furthering democracy or face to face face-to-face -face sessions as opposed to online sessions. So I'm certainly hoping that uh, there'll be turn turnarounds in the furthering online uh, uh, participative democracy in the coming months and years. Uh, I think that's enough for now, and I'll pass the word to whoever you want, Jerry. Um Thanks, Hank. I was just going to ask you ah. if, well, you sort of checked in the way I was going to ask you, which was, hey, has anything notable flashed by that was interesting ah. and memorable? And, <laughs> and you're like, well, I'm kind of disappointed because there's nothing new flashing by. And I'm wondering if, <clears throat> if through the the other work or uh, or other events you've been in, um, so it's just sort of how is, like, democracy is complicated, online democracy is really complicated. Uh, how is it shaping up in your head? In my head, uh, yeah, in my head, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, things going on in the metaverse. Uh, I think the metaverse, if it develops the way people on this call, I think, would like it to develop. And I know, Jerry, you and I have talked about uh, things in terms of what you like to call the betaverse. Uh, there'll be a lot of very interesting possibilities for people to uh, experience uh, uh, simulations and scenarios of, of different futures. Uh, and that could be different futures in terms of any kind of policy option that might be uh, uh, might be on the agenda for any government, whether it's uh, municipal, regional, national, or, or transnational. And on the basis of a concrete experience, uh, plus uh, reliable uh, uh, background information, uh, be able to make informed choices about what they really would like to uh, be part of policy or be part of the implementation of policy. Uh, and I think the technology is, is already there amongst uh, a growing amount of people. And I think also uh, young people, the will to uh, transform the, the, the present archaic uh, systems of democracy are there and we need to put our hands together and actually do it. And it's one of my reasons for being very interested in the Nordics, because in general, uh, they are the most democratic of countries in Europe. Uh, and since they are already starting to worry several years in advance about the futures of democracy there, I think that might be a place to set up uh, future labs for prototyping. I love that. Thanks, Hank. Um, I just put in the chat the last the last exciting thing I went to about democracy was in 2013, hosted by the Institute for the Future, run by Jake Donegan, who's awesome, uh, and it was the Reconstitutional Convention. And I met a bunch of a bunch of great thinkers in the space there, and uh, my head was bouncing around a lot after that event. And I, I wish that event had become a standing event because it was a good crowd and it was a great topic, and we were going at it in a productive way. But uh, it was a one-off, alas. Yeah, alas. A anyone else with thoughts on, on democracy or want to jump in? Otherwise, we'll go to uh, Ken, please. Yeah, I posted uh, in response to one of Gil's emails yesterday, IFTF has an upcoming event. Or, or no, it's, um, it's not IFTF. It's uh, long now. I think it's long now. It has Barry, uh, excuse me, not Barry. I'm looking at Gary, Barry's face here. It's got um, Stuart Brand, uh, Jonathan Haidt, and Kevin Kelly talking about the future of democracy in the next cycle of history coming. And so I'll mm -hmm. dig that link up and put it in the chat. Looks like it'll be a really good um, event to join. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Sounds great. Let's go, Barry, Ken, Jesse. Oh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope the yard crew doesn't make too much noise out there mowing the grass. This particular not, not hearing them at all right now. So you're okay. in good shape. That's good. Um, I've only I got a little bit less than an hour because I have to jump to another meeting at the top of the hour that happens also every Thursday. Um, I don't have too much to say. Um, the, it, 
there's nothing really new going on. What's going on is recurrence of the same old unsolved problems that have been burbling along uh, since really since the dawn of recorded history, since the dawn of civilization. And I think as, as I age, I become more aware of how formidable, how intractable, how ubiquitous they are and how they affect people in profound lifelong ways. And it's not that I haven't thought about them. A lot of these I've spent the last uh, one third of my or one fourth of my professional career thinking about these global problems as opposed to thinking about technical problems that I could earn a living at. These are problems that nobody earns a living at. But what's interesting is that a lot of the same tools for thought uh, that one uses to solve systemic problems in a narrow discipline also apply to these systemic problems that <coughs> afflict humankind and have afflicted humankind literally for thousands of years. And I've written about them. Uh, you know, I've got to the age where most of my thinking is behind me. And whenever I spend any time thinking about something, I always write it up when it's fresh and when I've got all the right vocabulary and complete sentences and paragraphs. And so I've written up about governance systems. Uh, I first ran into dysfunctional governance systems um, most directly in online communities. I mean, you, you run into dysfunctional governance <laughs> in your local community, in your state, in, in national politics, but, but there you're kind of distant from those. And I really began to uh, get up close and personal with governance systems in online communities. And that's where I really began to think about it in depth. And so I, I wrote it up more than once, more than one way over more than, more than a decade and a half. And one of the things about democracy, I, I think it might've been Churchill said, um, democracy is the, what is it? He says it's, it's the worst kind of government except for all the others, or mm -hmm. some, some quote to that effect. And what occurred to me about democracy is that it's the successor to theocracy and autocracy and other ocracies that preceded it. And there, there is a, a model that says that governments kind of cycle. So it's a cycle that was first proposed by uh, Gian Battista Vico, V-I-C-O, called the Biconian Cycle. And he says, yeah, we started off with theocracies, you know, mil so many millennia ago, and then we went to aristocracy and democracy and, and, and monarchies were in there too. And when they fail and they eventually fail, communities will cycle around <clears throat> to the next one, you know, recurring loop. And Vico noticed that in these transitions, you enter these periods of chaos. And what happens is the chaotic cycles are lasting longer and longer, like we never really get out of the chaotic cycles. And, and as I was thinking about this, what was on my mind is, <clears throat> here we are on the internet. And the internet has probably as many nodes on it as there are human beings that use them. And the nodes on the internet all talk to each other and they don't fight with each other. I mean, maybe they did at the beginning, they, they had uh, erratic connections, but now the internet, the nodes on the internet operating under internet protocols operate very functionally, very peaceably. And I, I asked myself, how, how come humans can't do that? How come machines can communicate very efficiently without going to war with each other when humans can't? And the answer is it's in the name protocol. Humans tend to regulate themselves with statutes and, and legislation and rules, especially when you're very young, you learn that you have to follow the rules and people in power get to make the rules and people who are not in power have to follow the rules. And somewhere along the line, when I was <clears throat> doing some research in, in how to teach science and mathematics, I came across a new branch of mathematics, new then, it's called chaos theory. I go, oh, this tells you how chaos is created in the first place. That's interesting. Because normally you don't want to make chaos, you want to make order. And I said, what is it about making chaos intentionally? And the insight, which is, by the way, not highlighted in the literature, but it's there. The easiest way to make chaos is to set up a system of rules 
and follow them religiously without deviation. And the easiest way to see this is with children's board games. Children's board games, uh, you don't roll the dice, you just have a strategy and you have a small set of rules. You can memorize the rules, it's easy to remember them. And if you play the game correctly, you don't cheat. You don't, you don't um, disobey the rules. And if you look at a, a simple children's board game like checkers or chess or more complicated ones like Go or Versailles, there's an astronomical number of perfectly legal games. And if you look at the state of a game board uh, in the middle, you really can't predict the end. And actually children's strategy games are sort of the introduction to chaos theory because they are examples of chaos. And then you know that in mathematics, you can generate a chaotic system like a fractal with a very simple recursion law. So you have a few set of rules, maybe only one or two or three, and you, and you follow them repeatedly. Every move obeys the rules and you get chaos. I go, what the hell? How do you get order? And then I went back to my graduate work in systems theory and optimization. I go, well, you have to build a system model. And if you have a good system model, you can mathematically solve it by inverting the system model for the function that you have to plug into the feedback loop. And feedback control theory tells you how to do that. I go, I get that. I get that in technology, we build feedback loops where the function feedback loop solves the system model and they, they behave gracefully, well-regulated. Why the hell can't we do that in human systems? The answer is because we don't use functions. We have a dysfunctional system because we try to regulate it with rules and that's a math error. And that was an insight that kind of came to me about 20 some years ago and I wrote it up. And I wrote it up in an article that uses a word that Jerry had actually outlawed in one of his workshops, paradigm. You're not allowed to say the word paradigm. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. I'm, right. sure, I'm not sure I outlawed it, but I remember it got sanctioned heavily. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you had to put yeah. a quarter in every time you said the word paradigm. So, yeah. so the paradigm shift would be, you start off with rules, which define games and, and also dramas. And the next level up is protocols. And protocols become familiar because the internet's full of protocols, so there's the technology internet. And then the next level up from protocols is functions. And we live in a dysfunctional society because we don't rely on functions except in very technical systems where we intentionally build carefully crafted functions. And then the next level up from functions is models. And we talk about system modeling and systems theory and then you get to the fifth level, which is an ecology of systems. And I go, my God, we are at, we are at the kindergarten level rules. Hardly anybody even knows what a protocol is or a function. Think of functions of a, a gathering where you eat wine and cheese with, and socialize with a bunch of people. And models, well, people talk about models, but maybe they're ones that you look at in a magazine, but <laughs> not, not system models. And ecology of systems, I'm thinking, holy shimoli, we've got to escalate four levels up from the rule-based system that's dysfunctional to get to a high functioning system where our regulatory mechanisms are constructed by solving the system models of how humans behave. And that's theoretically possible. It's been on paper at one level or another for a very long time. And I look at that, I go, but there's no way to implement it. Because how the devil are you going to get this population of homo schleppians to agree to implement this level of advance, of this advance of civilization from rules to protocols, to functions, to models, to systems? It hasn't happened in, you know, in the history of humankind. It hasn't happened in my lifetime. And the likelihood of it happening is frankly dwindling. And yet the literature is there. And so I look at this thing and I say, the same thing is happening over and over again. People, people have written up these, these, these insights. It's in the literature. And now what do you do? You just sit back and, and sort of wait for it to materialize? Well, maybe, but I'm not expecting it to materialize in the remaining 15 or 20 years of my time on this planet. Very, that is a lovely, a lovely riff. Thank you. Um, Stuart Brand talks about pace layering, 
Uh, Donella Meadows has the many ways of intervening in a system. These are all layered models. Have you considered your model against those? And also, uh, do you have a link to the piece you just mentioned that you posted 27 years ago? Is that around online? Yeah, someplace? It's, actually, it's called Paradigm Shift. I'll just put up. Yeah, Homo Quechians, definitely we don't want. Homo Schleppians, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you should see the riffs on, on that in the, in the chat. Okay. Um, but, um, but yeah, have you considered your, the model you just described relative to pace layering and uh, Meadows intervention points or, or, or are those things similar? They're probably similar. I haven't, I mean, I, I read Kevin Kelly's book and I commented on it. And I think actually he included the comment in one of his later books. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't read the one that you just mentioned, but as near as I can tell, the only difference between other um, versions of these ideas in mine is just the choice of words and, and the, the use of systems theoretic applied mathematical language, because most people don't use mathematical languages, they put it into narratives. Well, the other thing that, that you triggered for me was my dislike of game theory, which comes not from any deep knowledge of game theory, but from a, a, an awareness that all too often I've seen men use game theory to try to understand social dynamics and explain them. And in so doing, just butcher what happens to humans um, just over and over and over. And I'm, I'm like so disappointed every time somebody says, oh, and in game theory, I'm like, ah, oh, man. And then I try, I try to keep from, from like just being dismayed by what's about to come. But um, but but it feels like we try to we try to develop these models when when in some cases all we need is simple rules like assume good intent or deep listening and loving speech or or whatever. Um, let me pass to Grace, who has probably more than a thing to say about this topic. Yeah, let me let me know if can you um, do you hear me okay? We hear you okay, but your audio is your audio is kind of coming in and out. Yeah, I'm kind of. Is it now a it's tunnel? Now it's worse. Oh, you're in a tunnel. Going okay, good. A tunnel. Well, yeah. bad time. I get out of the tunnel, and I will, I will paint when I have better reception. Sounds great. Thanks. Um, cool. Uh, Neil, we've not. I mean, we started it at uh, 20 minutes ago, roughly. So we're, we've not been going that long. Can we pay now? Glad to see you. No. Yes, like the Verizon guy. Verizon guy. <laughs> now I'm in a new tunnel, though. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. So. I guess my comment's very similar to what you said, Jerry, in terms of um, response. Grace, your audio, your, 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 Grace, your audio is not working for us yet. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that you wait a minute until you're in a clearer place to jump in and don't forget what you're about to say. I'm sorry. It, 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 at first, it was possible to hear you and then, yeah, or, or put it in the chat either way. Um, but sorry about that. My apologies. Um, anybody else uh, want to jump in where we were? Yeah, I'd like to uh, make a comment here. Please do. Um, you know, we want to move from disorder to order, but the problem is that it's like uh, moving from steam to ice. If you go to too much order, you lose the life. So we want to stay in between, but all our effort is carrying us towards more order. And, and we have a, I think we have an innate human desire for order, or at least for peace and not too much disturbance. And yet too much order is, is basically problematic. We need a, we need a, we need a, a moderate amount of turbulence so that change is allowed to happen. And so that things aren't locked down too hard, I guess. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, um, Neil, did you want to jump in? Please. Yeah, I missed the earlier part, but picking up, can you hear me? I'm probably still muted. Hang on. No? Can no, you you're me? fine. You're fine. Oh, Figure good, good. Fine. Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry I'm late. Um, yeah, there's order, there's chaos, and there's chaos in between. Emergence happens in the gap between order and chaos through self organization. And self organization generally happens around either a strange attractor or because of the need to get away from something which is repelling. So that natural gradients in, in nature are generally formed by away from and towards. So in the cosmos, we're attracted towards gravity and therefore get sucked into and create you know, universes and galaxies and all the way down to planets. 
Um, in terms of self-organization of people, you need to disrupt coherence compassionately, otherwise you get stuck in wrong patterns. And especially when most people are currently in over their heads, incapable of seeing the complexity, incapable of recognizing uh, where we are on the clock of the world, making sense and getting enough people around you to have a critical mass that can also make sense is very, very difficult because of you know complexities around what is true, what is not, what is real, what is not, uh, what is happening, what is not. And so you need coherence, you need compassion to hold patterns longer than they would otherwise uh, be comfortable because you have to actually hold things together until new patterns can form. And so all of these things are emergent, um, but you can actually facilitate emergence provided you create safe enough conditions to both challenge and allow recoherence. Peggy Holman has a wonderful book on this called Engaging Emergence. And I'll leave it at that for now and nice to be back. Um, thank you very much. Uh, engaging Emergence, here it is. Um, I think, there we go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Grace, I don't know if you're in a better audio place, but you wrote into the chat. So you're wondering about the, about the balance between architecting a system that goes towards something and a system that is more like a response system that is designed to stay within certain boundaries. I like that. Um, it reminds me also of Rodney Brooks, who wrote long ago about making robots that behave in sort of lifelike ways, that very simple functions about how to sense and respond to your environment turned into really lifelike behaviors that were better than any attempts by AI researchers to actually do scene analysis and derive, you know, goal seeking and other kinds of things. It was very interesting that that simple simple rules followed um, closely or quickly worked really well. Um, so let me go back to the queue. Uh, let's go, Ken, Jesse, Pete. Hello, everybody. Um, so the health update, I. I have been I've walked twice this week for about 25 minutes each time and it has not uh, resulted in severe pain in my foot so that's a really nice thing I'm doing every other day kind of taking it slow because I don't want to end up with a, a relapse um, interesting conversation about democracy you know we're our, our book group on dawn of everything is is almost coming to a close I think we have two chapters left if I'm not mistaken and um, one of the things I've learned from this book is there is no um, there's no template for how people can live. You know, there have been so many experiments, so many different ways of coming together in different forms. But another thing I learned is the idea that we went from uh, hunter gatherers to pastoralists to, to quote the agricultural revolution, which actually took four thousand years to um, to take root. Haha, <laughs> um, which means it's hardly a revolution, um, and tribes lived right next to each other one tribe would be would be having slaves another would be you know totally egalitarian so there's really no uh one size fits all but there's tremendous creativity in the ways that people are able to come together and i think a lot of the problems that we have with our democracy right now and by the way the united states was downgraded to a flawed democracy back under the obama administration by the economists um uh, unit that, that evaluates democracy is whenever special interests take over and start to game the system so that they can get their, uh, their way. And so we don't really have a democracy here in the U.S. anymore, at least not what it used to be. Um, the Nordic countries actually are among the best. Um, and even there, I think there's still a lot of voices missing from the system. So, you know, I'm always about, can we get as many stakeholders as possible in the room and listen deeply to their concerns so that they get filtered into whatever approach we're gonna come up with to handle our challenges. And I think that's our challenge right now is not to invent the perfect form of governance because it's gonna be different based on geography and background and culture and tribes, but to be able to bring together people and. Um, and just say, you know, you you have a voice in this. We want to hear what you have to say. And we may not be able to accommodate everything you want, but we're going to make sure that you're you're included in whatever uh, process goes on here for creating order out of our out of our system. Um, hey, Mike, look like you're on a plane there. Oh, you're yeah, yeah. So you're going to Kuala Lumpur. Cool. Um, thanks for joining us. So anyway, that's those are just my quick thoughts on on democracy and and 
getting voices into the system um, and letting go of that myth that we had this evolutionary progression because we didn't. That's all cherry picked. That's not the actual way that um, humans have evolved. And there's tremendous ability for us to um, form and reform and and to be in places where okay, we're we're in a chaotic space here. So let's talk about how to be in chaos instead of trying to figure out how do we fix it. You know, sometimes if you can hang out in the chaos long enough, a completely different level of order makes itself known. But if you're so uncomfortable that the chaos means you have to move somewhere really quickly, chances are you're not going to go back. You're, you're going to go back to something that doesn't actually work. So those are my thoughts on that topic. Thanks for um, listening. And Ken, I just want to sort of build a little on what you said in the middle, which is this nothing without us, nothing about us without us is, is an important principle to people who think the way we're thinking in this room. And yet defeating it is a key principle for people trying to maintain power. So, so making sure that you can make decisions away from the people who were affected uh, in some way, sort of holding privilege or designing a democracy that's really sort of a representative democracy that has this electoral college that has senators that were built to, to make sure the South could, you know, outvote the North around slavery, like, the, like even the American perfect, wonderful democracy has all of these weirdnesses baked into it to kind of distance us from actual decision making. And then, and then the counter argument is, oh, direct democracy, whatever that is, would be terrible. And oh my gosh, you can't have everybody voting on everything. Nobody's smart, et cetera, et cetera. You can't trust people. And there's all these like circular arguments that we've that, that I think we've all been involved in over time in different kinds of ways. Uh, I'm going to paste a link to a, a thought in my brain called variants of democracy. There are many, and that's just democracy among the many different kinds of ways of organizing society, which is the point Grace is trying to make, which is like, <clears throat> hey, as soon as we use the lens or the filter of democracy, we're limiting our ability to imagine what, what's actually possible. So I, I love everything we're putting into the, the conversation here. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and there's something about, um, when I was consulting at UC Santa Cruz, my first day there, they said, welcome to UC Santa Cruz, we're 33 to one is a tie. And I was like, no, that's not consensus. That's blocking. You know, consensus is when the whole group says we want to find a way through and we will continue to work on this until we can all come to something that we agree we can support. It may not be my favorite thing, but I'm like, I'm I'm good. I will support this. And what Grace just put in there around power is you get people who say, no, it's going to be my way or the highway. And I am going to, you know, drive this thing no matter what. And then you get, you know, patriarchy and and a, a minor the tyranny of the minority over the majority. Um, and we have to keep finessing this thing. It keeps showing its rearing its ugly head again and again. It's not going away anytime soon. It's a long-term problem, shows up across cultures and times and space. And um, and yet what I've again going back to Don of Everything. I think we forget that there's so many other ways of coming together. And um, that narrative that says this is the natural progression, this is where we are, gets in the way of remembering that we could do this completely differently. Um, and especially now where we have so many tools for uh, polling people and finding out what they, what they think and bringing them together in conversation so that they can actually have real thoroughly thought through input as opposed to just uh, crowdsourcing an idea where you just get the top thing off someone's head, but they actually sit in conversation with other people and go, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And then they come out with a, a different product. Um, that's all available, but it's not being very well used at this point. Agreed. Neil? Yeah, thanks. Um, sorry to jump the queue on on uh, on this, but I, I attended the R3.0 conference in Amsterdam last week. Uh, I think Gil was there in the, in the uh, virtual audience. And um, it's around redesign for regeneration and resilience. And part of what you're talking about came up in the conference. Uh, consensus is no longer possible, uh, given the mess we're in. Um, and on the stage, we had a power play, uh, unintended. Uh, I, I'm sure it was set up by the conference leaders to actually show this is the cognitive dissonance in the room. We had a young activist who was mourning literally, literally the assassination of activists she knew in the Amazon. And we had sitting next to her, the two corporate sponsors, both men in their 50s and 60s, who 
uh, were talking about we need to go gently, slowly, slowly, business as usual with a bit of a twist, and they were good blokes. But when somebody actually said, what gives you despair and what gives you hope, they couldn't answer that. They had to change it from despair to concern. And yet you can feel it. We've got adult, we've got adult children, we've got kids, we've got grandkids, and we know we're not doing enough fast enough. Consensus in that room would have been impossible, but there is zero space, zero space for holding the cognitive dissonance that comes up between competing and conflicting worldviews with different views of reality and different vested interests. We need to actually be having mechanisms for collective sense making, which allow us to recognize the realities that are staring us in the effing face and then say, and now what, which is the name of the initiative we've just launched on our website, I'll come to that later. But the point I'm trying to make here is there is zero mechanism now for true consensus for things that really matter. And that is the problem. And that is the issue in, in, in America. It is the issue in Australia. And even the false horizons, I heard horizons mentioned, that we reach where we think we've reached consensus are less than what is necessary. We are going to have to learn to live with massive disruption as system boundaries completely break down. And we are in that collapse already. We're just lucky enough in the global north to be able to talk about it. Um, and I want to point, I agree with everything you said, I want to point out that the word consensus, there is no consensus on the word consensus. It's a very tricky word. For some people, consensus actually means 100% of people agreed. Uh, and I took a Scott Peck workshop many years ago about his book, The Different Drum. And the first thing he did was talk about consensus and how in an earlier group, uh, the Foundation for Community Encouragement had come up with their own definition of consensus, which was roughly, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, that everybody feels like they've been heard and can agree to move forward, but there's not 100% agreement. Uh, Quakers have a thing called sense of the meeting, which is sort of like that. It's really interesting. But, but, but like the word democracy, it, consensus is a word we use a lot. Um, and, and, and it can be like your mileage may vary wildly on, on what it is or how it works. Thanks, Neil. Um, so many comments that I've lost where I pasted who's next. How about Jesse Pete Gill? Thanks, Jerry. Hi, everyone. Hey. This is such a delicious conversation. And I don't know, I, I guess I'll reintroduce myself for those who don't know me. Um, I'm involved in addressing, I'm a learning strategist, and I'm very passionate about sleep and insomnia and addressing insomnia through a, a holistic approach. And I use data analytics and nudges. And my secret isn't in the routines, although that's very important, um, but in the mindset about solving problems in general. And often nothing changes but the mind when addressing issues like anxi anxiety and insomnia. So when we're talking about these issues, I can sense the, that feeling in the room. There's the, the chaotic uh, environment that we're in and that we're projecting into our future. It's, um, yeah, it's not just about setting up our environment, but responding to the environment. But I do wanna make a shift and talk about leveraging collective intelligence to address the recurring systematic problems that, that you were talking about. Um, I listened to William McAskill, uh, the, he's the author of What We Owe the Future. And he was talking about how the brains of humans are three times as bigger as chimpanzees, but it's not about that that makes us evolve so much faster. It's how we leverage many brains together to work together towards an outcome. And we're the only species that, um, well, the way that he said it was way better than that, but um, we have a leg up in that. So I really love that what Barry brought up um, in terms of leveraging um, about systematic power and the discussion of power, because if we can leverage systematic power um, that Barry spoke to, but for the good of society and the planet, um, I think that that there is a true chance there. And I am not, and I am optimistic. I remain that way. And that that's typically me, but um, we'd love to sit in a room with people who are saying, oh boy, there's not much that we can do from here. Um, it's, <laughs> I'm losing hope to lift that up immediately because with the power of the right tools, with the right people in the right time, so much can change. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm addressing that through AI. Um, 
on, on something called goodstrings.ai. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, we'd love for you to, to reach out. I love that, Jesse. Do you want to say a little bit more about Good Strings? Yeah. So if you go, if you go there right now, goodstrings.ai, it's um, just a survey um, because it's an intake form. So everyone, you, you know, when you say you're pulling strings, that's we're talking about power, right? Um, in politics or in um, money. And why not leverage those strings in a good way by connecting the people that are interested in the same, addressing the same issues? So this leans into SDGs and the uh, donut econ economy. And so what we're doing is connecting people to address topics they're more pa most passionate about with people who want to support that. And that could be a person who is a writer, it could be a speaker, it could be um, a, a vendor to address the whole supply chain. But once you connect people, um, those strings start forming in a good way. And that's theory. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah. So feel free to go there and, and add your own, uh, each, each one of you um, is a candidate for, <laughs> for uh, seeding this database. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you. I really, it's, it's lovely to, to have you in the conversation and I'm, I'm, I'm loving this conversation too. So um, let us go Pete, Gil, Stacy. And thanks. Good morning, everybody. And uh, given a choice between covering uh, one thing at reasonable speed or eight things at hyperspeed, um, I'm going to pick hyperspeed. Um, uh, things that are top of mind for me right now, um, I'm super, still super excited about AI art and illustration. Um, if you're interested at all in imaging images, art, photography, anything like that, you should be playing around with uh, Dolly or Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey or, or one of the other tools. Uh, it's it, it's amazing. Um, uh, Massive Wiki is going well. Um, we just did a, a change yesterday that introduces um, author date uh, change notes for every file on the wiki on the all pages uh, list. Uh, right now it's only released on the Lionsburg wiki, but we'll migrate it to the other wikis soon. So that kind of finally gives us a, a decent version of recent changes for a wiki and, and super exciting. Um, I need to market ma massive wiki more. Um, my first place is probably going to be talking about it uh, in the Obsidian forums, uh, but need to spread it out a little bit more anyway. Um, I'm going to be, I'm working on a massive wiki version of the group work stack, uh, much loved kind of uh, pattern language uh, that some of us know about. I'm super excited about that. Uh, and Bill Anderson and I have started talking about um, the, the hard part, even though we've spent a lot of time doing technical stuff with the massive wiki, the hard part is actually how you wiki together, wiki philosophy in the wiki way. So we're going to start doing that uh, exploration soon. Um, Coming back to, to Ken uh, talking about Dawn of Everything, there's a punchline I put in this one, and it's the end of the thing I posted before that. Um, one, of the, one of the things you come away from the book realizing or understanding um, in a way that was worth the whole book uh, is that we have this assumption that human societies get more complex. Complexity must mean hierarchical organization. And that's just like something that's baked into us. And it seems like a, a law of physics. And they demonstrate over and over and over that there's nothing physically lawful about that. Um, hierarchy and especially domination is not a, a way that p humans inevitably gather themselves into societies. And, and they have a number of illustrations of societies that had um, you know, relatively flat organization and not this dominance hierarchy that we think is is um, inevitable. It's not at all inevitable. Um, Vincent and I, uh, I'm, I'm doing the coding on something called Chat Chainsaw where you can pour in a, a Zoom chat and it comes out broken up into um, messages um, in a way that Vincent's going to be able to let people bookmark or link or connect single messages out of a chat. Um, with the links that are in them and things like that. So uh, we're super excited about that. Uh, Biweekly Plex Dispatch comes out next week. Uh, send me an email with what's uh, live for you in the network. Uh, it can be really short, just a couple sentences, and, and I'll try mm -hmm. to get it in the issue. 
Um, another thing that's kind of been going on for a while is this idea of drop-in calls, uh, calls that don't really have an agenda but have a scheduled time. Um, I'm keeping on the Plex uh, weekly calendar. I, I've got a grid of calls. Um, I'd love to fill in more. I'd like to see more of us going to each other's uh, regular calls and just hanging out. Um, I'm also kind of interesting, uh, interested, I haven't started doing this, but um, uh, a few of us, you can book time fairly easily with us on a calendar or something like that. And so um, I think it would be cool to kind of, I, I'd like to add kind of a, a list of those, you know, if you want to get hold of Pete, um, you know, this is how you sign up uh, for, you know, half an hour, an hour with him. Um, finally, just this morning, um, uh, I was reflecting on, interestingly enough, uh, some of the ways that we've organized ourselves in Mattermost. Uh, and I came up with this kind of hierarchy of design. Um, I, I, I was telling somebody that uh, one, of the, one of the things that we do on Mattermost is not think about or not facilitate very well um, how we're using the channels which is fine, um, it's not a problem, um, but it's a, I feel like it's a lost opportunity. So it's a little bit on my mind. And so then it made me think about things. And uh, right now we have a lot of places where we think we have designed interactions, but what we're actually doing is uh, emerging into um, the way we interact. We could have been doing it in, in some designed way. And design facilitation, kind of the same thing. But then one of the things that I was reflecting on is that even when we do design, it's kind of like um, uh, unicentric. Uh, some, some one person said, "I think we'll do it this way," or maybe two people got together and agreed on, "I think we'll do it this way." Um, another thing is maybe polycentric design, where we've got different design ideas competing, often without without reflecting on that, that they're competing. So, you know, I've got a way of facilitating the space. She's got a way of facilitating the space. They've got a way of facilitating the space. We all think that we're doing it together the same way. And each of us is fighting essentially without realizing it um, about, you know, I, I don't understand why this isn't going well, or I don't understand what's going on. And it's par partly this polycentric design. Um, what we don't do a lot, I think, is kind of the, the top end of this hierarchy, uh, top end of this steps, um, which is collaborative design and shared design, where we actually say, hey, um, we're interacting in this space. Um, let's collaboratively design how we want to interact with this. Let's talk about um, the way that we interact and not only, um, not only do that together, you know, the, I think a level above that, I called it shared design. This is essentially the idea of kind of consensus, right? Let's not only talk about doing it together, let's like ideate together, but then actually let's come to some kind of agreement about how, we, how we've designed it um, and obviously iterate on that, um, you know, uh, do it for a while, get some feedback, uh, re-ideate and, and redesign. So uh, maybe I'll write something more about that that uh, gradient, maybe, maybe I won't, we'll see. Uh, that's it, thanks. Keith, that was a hyperspeed tour through many things and still made sense, it's kind of crazy. Um, thank you for that. Anybody with comments about any of that? Okay, um, uh, Neil. Just a quick one. Um, the last part you said there was very related to what we've talked about before in terms of the need for meta-constitutional rules. What are the rules that we can agree on by which we will agree on the rules? Um, and then, you know, within that, so what, what is the system's context? Uh, what are the ethical principles? Uh, what are the capability and maturity requirements? What are the educational requirements? And this is the real difficulty we have with our current democracies is that we automatically ascribe an adult intelligence and the capacity to go beyond uh, in over our heads to actually make decisions on behalf of all of us. Um, if a plane is crashing, do you give a joystick to every passenger? Uh, and this is the issue we have. So how are we going to decide who makes decisions on our behalf and how are we going to collectively make decisions? Uh, I love the idea of design. Uh, and I think that holding space for that once you've brought people up to speed in the same way that say a citizens assembly has done can be a very good way of getting a collective agreement on ways that are better for the way we, way we will go forward. But if your understanding of reality is flawed, 
then the outcome will be flawed. Is there anybody who doesn't have a flawed understanding of reality in this call? <laughs> Incomplete. For that's, sure. that's a great, great question. Great question, Ken. And and yet this is the challenge we have. Uh, if you take the, the spiritual bypass model, then you know reality is still being formed, and we can create our own reality. And don't worry about these real things that are actually happening, like the drying up of the European rivers, or the burning of the Amazon, or the size uh, an area the size of Italy burning in Australia, or the floods in Pakistan. Right. And yet there are elements of that reality which are real for everybody, uh, but we just some of us choose not to see them. And unless we can face that reality and then live the questions together, then we're not going to be able to find some sort of consensual agreement. Love that. Um, next in our queue are Gil, Stacy, Carl, and Gil. You represented three times in my gallery view. I think that I think the the one you logged out of is still sort of present, and will probably time out or something. And your note takers there as well. So so I'm, you are you are outnumbering us soon. I'm trying to skew the consensus, Jerry. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, everybody. This is a great call. Uh, I'm gonna have to leave the top of the hour just heads up on that. Really appreciate uh, all that's gone before. Pete, uh, it takes me a while to catch my breath after your hyper deliveries. Thank you for everything that's in there. Um, um, Jesse, good to meet you. Uh, I want to hear, I like, uh, I'm, I'm going to track down the threads. I want to hear more about your insomnia work uh, on the theme of hope. Uh, in the face of the despair that uh, Neil shared from the R3.0 conference. Um, I, I, find, I find hope in the unpredictability, in the non-deterministic nature of the mess. It look, you know, what looks awful but could change. And Dawn of Everything has fed that in a number of ways, just seeing the, you know, not just the enormous variety, but the trending in and out of human society over these tens of thousands of years. Uh, and even the societies that move seasonally from hierarchy to, to non-hierarchical organization um, gives me you know, it gives me kind of a broad opening into the enormous variety of human prospect and the unpredictability of even what looks absolutely certain uh, 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 ahead of us on the landscape. Uh, back to what Barry said earlier in Ken's comments. Um, um, later on in the call, I, I fall more on the Ken and Neil end of the spectrum than the Barry end of the spectrum on this conversation. Um, um, <clears throat> Barry, as I listen to you, you have a lot more faith in the deterministic potential of humans encountering com complex systems. Uh, and I don't. Uh, you know, somebody, uh, can you just talk about the flawed understanding of reality? I take that as a given. Um, that there is not possible an unflawed understanding of reality or more, maybe more specifically um, a uni universally shared interpretations of what reality is because we encounter it through our interpretations and they're always subjective and they're always rooted in our history and our biology and our experience together and so forth. And, you know, good Lord, you know, you can plant people on the street and have a car, go, car drive by and they won't even agree on the color of the car. So uh, I don't want to. I don't want to hear a lot about reality. Although you know, rivers running dry and people starving to death is a reality. Spell maybe we'll spell it differently or something. Um, uh, but how we how we encounter that river running dry, how we feel about it, how we think about it, what we do about it, that's of a very different order. And so you have the people at the conference talking about no, I'd rather talk about concern than despair you know, around the same objective reality of so many deaths for so many reasons and so forth. So, um, um, so I, I think Barry, I heard you say that as you, I like the stacks, the stacks are good and, uh, and orienting, but I think you said that with an un sufficient understanding of systems and system complexity, you can actually solve in a mathematical sense uh, for things. And I think that's folly in the realm of human affairs and the emergence from complex adaptive systems that we're living in. Uh, it's, it's great for orienting, but it's not like push a button on a big enough computer and we're gonna get an answer to this stuff. It's more in the mess of how human beings interact and coordinate. I love the notion of shared design. Um, 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 you know, I, I often go back these days to Norbert Wiener's uh, cybernetics book from 1940, whatever it was, eight or seven or something like that, which was, which was subtitled, um, uh, um, communications and control in 
whatever, I forget the whole subtitle. And I keep on replacing communications and control with communications and coordination. Because I think we're in a realm that we can't control and we have to bloody well figure out how to coordinate among ourselves in all these various ways. Um, can you pop in the chat the thing about the nutmeg book? And if you could riff for a moment on, uh, uh, on the shift that those folks were asserting from humans as part of a living world to humans as uh, an extractor of, of value from non-living systems, which by the way, coincidentally is, you know, co-parallel with the emergence of capital uh, 500 or whatever years ago. Um, uh, the nutmex curse, thank you. But yeah, Ken, uh, Pete, if you just say a little bit about, uh, um, Ken, a little bit about the riff that you gave me or somebody uh, in recent weeks about that. Uh, and how fundamental it is to the messes that we've created and our ways of navigating them. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you everybody for this rich, rich conversation. Ken, you Thanks, wanna say Tim. that? Three's still there. Yeah, um, I'm about 150 pages into a 300 page book. So um, just to have that as context. Then that makes curse. Um, Nutmeg only grows on a very small number of islands in the Dutch East Indi in the in the East Indies, and um, nutmeg shows up in Egypt uh, 300 years before Christ. So uh, these people had been trading across the Indian Ocean, uh, India, Afghanistan, all the you know they they, they had um, small little tiny island. They had this huge web of interconnections with. Uh, uh, traders and including up and down in Japan and stuff. And then um, the Dutch East India Company in 1521 came in and said, uh, we're taking over. We want the we want the nutmeg. So um, we will kill you. We'll enslave you or we'll drive you off the island. But get the hell out of here because it's ours now. And uh, around that same time, late uh, early 1500s, a new idea was taking shape in Europe, which saw uh, the earth not as alive, which had been the the previous paradigm without i'd hope i'd have to pay a quarter for that um so they um th this new idea was that the earth is inert and it only is productive when humans work it which is why when the europeans arrived on the shores of north america they looked at the land and couldn't see that it had been worked and they said therefore we are within our rights to take it from the indians because they're not working it they're not making it productive and um it's there's a very interesting chapter on what happened they said you know we can't even call it war uh because what happened in north america was way beyond war uh the author calls it omnicide they were basically destroying everything in their path and when you have an ideology that says the world is inert it's simply a pile of resources that's only useful when we are exploiting it when we're extracting things when we're burning things you know then you have um the ability to destroy the world and the other thing about this book is it talks about uh agency human beings have this tendency to ascribe agency only to human beings but if you grew up in a in a world that's alive, a volcano has agency, a spice has agency, land has agency, the climate has agency. We are seeing this now. You know, the 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 world that we are living in is one where suddenly there's a lot of agency on the part of nature that's showing up in ways that are incredibly troubling to human beings because we always assumed it was inert and incapable of adapting. But if you burn enough fossil fuels, you will change the climate. If you put enough chemicals in the environment, you will change your biochemistry. Um, anyway, so that's that's just a little quick riff on what's in this book. It's a very well-written book. The guy's a novelist. It, it tells a great story. And it's also, in many ways, incredibly depressing. So just know that if you decide to take it on. Um, I'm enjoying reading it. I'm getting a lot out of it. And there's things that sometimes I'm just like, oh, my God, how did we freaking do this? Yeah, Ken, thank you for that uh, uh, very much. The one thing I would add is that for all, all of our talk about consensus and community, hu human deliberation and various kinds of constellations, for most of our history, we, for better or for worse, lived with the same people for our, our entire lives in a relatively small circle. It might have been 100 people or it might have been 100,000. But uh, you know, one of the freedoms that Graeber and Wengro talk about is the, free is the freedom to up and leave your society and go somewhere else. But mostly people stayed with each other and had lifelong relationships with each other. And what got worked out got worked out within that social context. That is so far away from where we are now. 
uh, where we have you know infinite mobility and the the blessing and the curse of being able to come together in groups like these, but not be wedded to each other and not have our lives dependent on each other, uh, yeah. and and not have a kind of you know, not have the kind of commitment to stand with each other in trouble. Uh, in life and death circumstances. I and mean, we have that conceptually. We have a certain kind of loyalty to each other in this groups and the many groups we're in, but it's different than, you know, living in a great, 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 great grandparents have lived. It's a very different context. And we're trying to invent something in this very differently patterned world. And um, with that, I'm sorry, I've got to hop to another call previously scheduled. Uh, Big love to you all. I'll listen to the rest of the recording and see you next time. Thanks, Gil. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, there's so many good books that intersect here. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Neil just put Melanie Goodchild in the in the conversation. Nutmeg's Curse. So so many of these. And Ken and I were sort of uh, riffing on this uh, yesterday, or yesterday, the day before, uh, on how do we digest all of this together so that the different juicy nuggets of insight are more easily available to us. How, one of my frustrations is that OGM doesn't use OGM -y tools that much. We don't, we don't, we don't help one another. We, we do help one another digest or at least look toward the resources. I think we're very good at saying, oh, this is a juicy topic. Here's a book, here's a book, here's a movie, here's a documentary, here's a person, here's a movement. We do that a bunch and I'm busy like quickly collecting them up and trying to steward them, you know, uh, put them in, into my own little map. Um, but we, we, and, and then Pete has sort of slowed down the speed and said, let's take a book, the dawn of everything, and let's get together and go chapter by chapter and do book club style, like, like deconstruction of what's in there, which is super useful. Um, how do we then share out the nuggets of wisdom in some easier to use and implement way? And in some way that also merges these threads in, in the way that this conversation feels like it's doing nicely. So how do we make that more explicit or available um, online? Just a thought. Uh, so we have at this point, um, Stacy Carl Rick. So Ken, first, I just have to tell you, I want I want to let you know, people get very uncomfortable by my dog's sense of agency. They don't like that at all. Um, yeah, I just want to share something positive because before getting on the call, I was watching something that I've been like dreaming about for 10 years. And I really think it would be the right direction to go when I hear you know the conversations about decision-making and power dynamics. So, I've been on a news blackout for a while and I had some free time. So I put on Al Jazeera English, which is what I usually do to try to catch up. And there, there was a conversation about the black hole and it was a male moderator and it happened to be three female um, professors. But what was really interesting about it is that after they had their discussion, all the questions came from YouTube. And what I noticed is that the male interviewer, who quite frankly was not as sharp as the professors, kind of mocked one of the questions coming in, which I thought was a fascinating question. And it was answered in a way that made perfect sense. But I'm pointing it out because, you know, Grace had put in the chat about power dynamics. And had it not been for the dynamics of, you know, the three experts who were willing to take on the question seriously, that one figure could have just squashed the whole discussion. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And I really, the idea of just regular ordinary people being able to ask questions of experts to me is so key to be able to come to some sort of consensus, however we decide to define that word. So that's my checking. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Uh, the power of gatekeepers is enormous, gigantic. And so many people are gatekeepers. A long time ago, I think I told the story here of Murray Rothbart, uh, a libertarian who writes a critique of one of my favorite books, Carl Polanyi's The Great Transformation. And in his critique, basically, basically is telling his followers, do not bother reading this horrible work, which does this, 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 this. It's a terrible thing. 
like like he's basically gatekeeping for his community because if they were to go read it they'd be like oh this is kind of cool and this guy's not yelling and he doesn't commit any of these sins that Rothbart accuses him of committing and the same thing is happening politically at this point where with the demonization of socialism and whatnot you know this is happening constantly all the time gatekeepers are also opinion leaders and influencers and their job in some sense i mean Putin is managing somehow to to keep Russia on the tracks of being this horrible, despicable pariah in the world, even though internally, the media is all like, hey, no, no dissent, uh, you know, don't don't talk about this. So this, this just happens all over the place. Pete, thank you. That is, uh, that is, in fact, uh, the letter that Rothbart wrote. Um, so let's go back to our queue where we had um, Carl Rick Grace. Yeah, fascinating conversation today, as always. Uh, yeah, I've got, I'm uh, been working on my PhD. I actually took a, um, I actually withdrew and will be reapplying next summer. And uh, I'm uh, kind of going back, going back to the basics and things. So I ha I've had idea, I've been a big follower of getting things done. Sorry, okay. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, Carl. Can you just do us a favor and tilt your screen down so we can see your face? Oh, okay. I was about to ask Thanks. the same thing. Thank you. Okay. Re really connecting with your hairline. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah with getting things done. Um, and uh, then um, I found, ran across the book on the Zettelkasten. Uh, that um, it's... Uh, thing about writing and stuff too because it's uh some of the writing things it's like really getting granular too and i'm um, there's the pomodoro technique um it's just 25 minutes or less i think a lot of people but it's kind of going back to the basics um i work at the general services administration and we were really at the uh forefront of so many things i'll post a link to it we have a sustainer sustainable facilities um, tool um, and things that's publicly available and really amazing that we've just got to um, had people giving us a briefing yesterday. Um, yeah, it's just, um, it's really, a, it's it's really, we're at the, the hub. In fact, uh, one of my friends had jokes, we're the BASF of government. We don't help. We don't provide the services to citizens directly. We help other agencies provide them better. But we really, um, so there's that piece of it. I'm also getting more involved in the IRSS, um, the in International Society for the System Sciences. And the woman who's going to be running it, it she's the president-elect. She's actually here in the D.C. area um, at GW. And, She's been in France for three years, but she's coming back. So I'm looking forward to um, talking with her more. Um, one of my primary mentors is uh, um, William E. Smith. He um, did a lot of work with the World Bank and United Nations. And he his um, he talks of his framework is about purpose and power. So that's um, a core part of my sense making. Um, process is kind of just there's almost like this intuitive um recognition of power relationships among things so it, it tends towards three and nine component um, frameworks and um things so uh, that's um one of the one of the papers i'm writing is looking at at, at his work there and um Bordeaux's field theory and, and some other things there um i guess with one of the uh, some of you probably know uh you know jeff conklin and stuff to all his work with dialogue and issue and issue mapping um it's it's interesting because both jeff conklin and and edward de bono with um six thinking hats they so focused on it as um facilitation methods for real-time meetings but it, there's so much power there in in using it for individual sense making and things too um, uh, 
So yeah, that's, um, oh yeah. And then there's a, well, I added um, Doug Engelbart's the other, been the other major influence for me. And um, there's a guy, Froda Hagland, I don't know if um, he has this whole future of text uh, process and the, the, we've got the um, symposium, symposium coming up the 27th and 28th of September here. It's on um, virtual reality type of stuff. And I had no idea there's this whole XR accessibility community. They just had a, a massive uh, um, symposium of their own um, earlier in the summer and stuff. So I've been working to make some connections uh, there. But um, yeah, just a lot of fascinating things going on right now. Uh, my check-in um thanks carl thank you very much and, and you're you're just involved in lots of things that are interesting that mix together in interesting ways so um thank you for sharing all those resources with us as well um we have rick neil john <laughs> And I guess Rick had to jump off. My apologies. Um, so let's go straight to Neil, then John, then Michael, then me. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we attended the um, R3 point. I'm in Leuven in uh, Belgium, for those that uh, haven't uh, met me online before. Um, my partner, uh, both life partner and apocalypse partner, and uh, Billen is a... Uh, a psychologist. Uh, our partner in Australia is a master facilitator, and I'm a poet and um, systems thinker, uh, photographer who weaves together the pieces. And we just released our, our website uh, called And Now What. And I'll just post it here in the chat. Sorry, I posted too soon a minute ago. It uh, jumped jumped the gun on me. Um, in terms of uh, what this means for people, this is this is this is pretty heavy stuff. Um, we don't shy away from facing the reality of where we currently are on the clock of the world. And I just wanted to put it out there for people. If you don't feel like reading something that uh, might scare you because it's too scary, don't. Um, there's a warning on the door. So if you come in through the home page, you'll see the warning on the door. If you come in, I hope you find that you see the beauty, goodness, truth, love, uh, <coughs> grief, um, and all of those elements of still living in the now uh, that are so critical in this period that we're in. We talked before uh, earlier on this call about civilizations. I think Gil was mentioning civilizations moving on or leaving your civilization. There is nowhere to go anymore. We are on one planet. We are interconnected. We're in hyper complex systems and they're in collapse. So I'll leave it at that. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I'd be really interested in considered feedback on what we're doing, not just on technical details, but if anybody's got any hints on, you could do this better if you do this, I'd be really handy. Uh, I'm more interested in, do you feel it? Do you need to talk? Do you know others that need to talk? We think there's a, a massive, using the horrible marketing term, market for frustrated, concerned, and unable to show up uh, people from full on executives uh, who are starting to become more and more uh, evident in their in their talks, even uh, uh, Macron came out on the 28th, uh, talking uh, 28th of August, talking about we have reached the end of abundance uh, and the end of insouciance, um, yeah, and they're predicting the the collapse that we know is happening. Uh, they're not actually collapse aware enough to state that, and they're very careful in democracies to do that, but uh, you can feel it in Europe. We've luckily had 13 millimeters of rain uh, since we got back, but we're in the middle of potentially a 500 year drought, uh, sorry, 500 year return interval drought. Um, rivers that are meant to be cooling uh, nuclear power stations or supporting coal traveling along uh, the Rhine no longer run. The Po isn't running. Uh, the Rhine is drying up. Um, the Loire is drying up. Um, so we have major issues ahead. I know Klaus isn't on this call, but he's talking about food security. We've got food security, water security, energy security. Our energy prices in Europe are going to increase three times, if not five times this uh, winter alone, potentially putting power out of reach for most people, um, uh, most people on less than normal salary. 
Uh, so there is so massive social unrest coming. Um, and I, I'm here uh, with the team that we've got to provide, uh, if necessary, confidential coaching services, uh, courageous conversations, which will potentially be 12, uh, uh, a heartbeat of inner and outer work, um, and then also uh, facilitated uh, keynote listening and uh, system synthesis, which I do pretty well, and then potentially up to whole systems design if we can find anybody with sufficient critical mass anywhere in a bioregion to start doing something meaningful given where we're at. So thanks very much for hearing me, guys. I'm sorry it's such a dire message. It's um, literally the culmination of my life's work. Uh, exactly. Thanks, Neil. And and in, in in tongue firmly in cheek, I've kind of been missing our doom, our extremely doomy conversations. And uh, you are framing it in a way that's very much about how do we get through this and now what? How do we help? Uh, and I just I just uh, realized I needed to rearrange a couple of things in my brain. So I I uh, put and now what under the thought uh, that says we're driving uh, our bus over the cliff. What should we do? Uh, which is connected to we're, we're in the middle of five crises or pick your number of crises or whatever else. And then to take just an amateur slice at how people are coping with this, I just wrote down, it seems like it seems like people might be anywhere on this kind of a spectrum of simple despair where what they need right now is actual maybe physical support or psychological support or something, but they're in a in a really dire situation. Then there's discouragement or doubt or wondering what, you know, this idea that it's just me, I can't have anything sort of disempowerment or lack of agency or whatever that might be. Then there's people in action doing stuff, some of whom are just picking up litter on beaches or uh, whatever it might be, but taking some action, changing their behaviors and their consumption in different ways. And then I think on, on the far other end of the spectrum is some form of transformation where we actually come together and use our senses and understand sort of the combinatorial effects of systems thinking and a bunch of the stuff that Barry put on the on this call early, combined with the ways you're looking at the world, Neil, and and, and just kind of leveraging efforts uh, in order to cause quicker, deeper, more important change in some way. And that's and to me, that's a, a different in type or in kind from just taking action on something which is useful uh, you know even just buying less stuff is useful uh, or going all electric or who knows what but but there's some some spectrum of action there that i think is interesting and helping people realize which place here they are in may be useful uh, helping people realize that there's a space to the farther right in this conceptual diagram might be useful so that they can say oh gosh I could step out of just doing this and step into that and here's how and where. I don't know. I just um, thought I'd offer that up. If I can just add one thing, I, I gave a talk at the R3.0 Advocation Partners Day, uh, which was the day following the, um, the two-day conference. And it was called the Collapse Roller Coaster. They created the space for me to talk about the Collapse Roller Coaster. Unfortunately, the technology on the day failed me, so I ended up sitting hunched over a computer, not being able to see the audience of about 10 or 12 behind me, and with the online audience not being able to see me. Mm. Um, at the end of that, uh, I had an overwhelming uh, urge to sob. I could not help it. Uh, I did not feel supported by the community because they cannot see it. They cannot feel it, and they have not sufficient capability, maturity, or consciousness to actually feel it and know what to do with it. So nobody knows how to handle this stuff. This is this third space stuff. And the other thing that hurt really badly was the fact that we were in a, a sustainable basement, right? A concrete stepped basement underneath ABN AMRO, the sponsors. The air conditioning was groaning and crunching. It was sounded like Mosquito Coast uh, with Harrison Ford with the, oh God. you know, the, <laughs> and I literally left that space unable to breathe, went upstairs, stood there, stunned in in the glass restaurant looking which way to go turned right into the courtyard wondering am i going into the wrong space there was a sunny courtyard and i lay on a wooden bench with people walking past me in suits and i looked up and i realized the reason i was feeling this pain was that i was literally in the belly of the beast the belly of the beast which is incapable of seeing this incapable of acting fast enough and unable 
to actually invite us upstairs to the boardrooms to have these conversations. And so I'm happy to share my presentation uh, with the uh, OGM online group. I obviously won't have the words with it, but this is heavy shit. Mm -hmm. And if you're not feeling it, right, you will. And when you do, remember us. I'll do my best. Okay, thanks. Thank, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Um, John, Michael, then me. Was that me? That's you, John. Oh, great. Wow. Uh, hard to come after Neil with anything of proportionate significance. Uh, but thank you for that, Neil. Um, I, I'm going to TEDx Marin this Saturday. You know, another one of these efforts we all know about. Uh, I'm guessing that quite a few, I'm reading the network state, which is free. You can get the PDF online. I'm guessing Grace, it's, it's very unlikely that she hasn't read it, uh, but it's from a perspective of a somewhat of a pre pre crypto crash, very strong Bitcoin maximalist, but it's, it's much richer than that. I mean, even though I would disagree on, and we would all disagree about a lot of things in there, but there's a lot of stuff about uh, a network quasi state, non-geographic collaborations of people and the importance of exit voting. Like you, you collaborate with your friends virtually and you're all working, which is of course, you know, a very elite view of looking at things. And you say to a city, you know, you need to change your policy on X or we're all going to leave. And it's credible because you're, you're all virtual. That was a that was an interesting idea, de de definitely an interesting idea. And there's other interesting ideas which those of us who want to organize uh, new kinds of not just virtual but virtual live and the crossover. That's the real interesting thing is what's the crossover between the digital community and the real community, and in what ways can a partial state, not a not a legal not necessarily a legal state, but a substantial collection of people that can issue something like a self-sovereign identity and issue it, let's say, to refugees who can't get one from their government. Uh, you know, this, this becomes an interesting force in the world. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm reading and I'm writing a story about um, democracy emerging in a Kiwanis club in the Midwest. I figured wow, I'd anchor it. Kiwanis, in. nice. <laughs> anchor it in something very midwestern corn fed i'm even calling the main character james stewart you know after obviously jimmy stewart <laughs> you know? okay so that's what i'm working on um grace i don't know if you can jump in from the train but if you want to give it a try because i'm sure you have a lot to say here uh, i don't know what i would say um really i, I yeah I understand. The network it. state, it's, it's a really interesting concept, right? The concept that any group of people could break off and legal or not legal have their own economic system based on the fact that you could now print your own money pretty easily. I think that the maximalist view is incredibly ignorant about the embodiment of their actual physical beings. And we've been seeing, you know, shutdowns of cloud computing. We've been seeing people being arrested. We've been seeing that actually as an industry in Web3, we don't own even the steel on, you know, like we don't own the boxes that are hosting our network. And so to what Neil was speaking about, it's like, look, if you haven't got a garden, it doesn't matter that you can print money on a blockchain you're going to go hungry. And that's really the basis of the network state that we're creating is much more ground based and Balaji's like fantasy about we're going to have these network state with just one commandment. It's like, well, how are you going to agree on something like should we fund the fire brigade? If your you know, one commandment has nothing to do with that. And so we're really basing it on reformating culture. I hope we're not as late as Neil seems to be indicating that we are. But uh, but yeah, it, I think it has to start with 
the physical presence and recognizing that we need to support our bodies, otherwise we don't really have freedom or independence. Thank you so much, very much. Um, Neil, did you want to jump back in? Or are you waving goodbye? No, I was just waving to, to what was just said. So thank you. Oh, that. That, usually that usually that's like a two hand wiggle. Yeah, sorry, I had a book in the other hand. So uh, exactly, you were you were like. <laughs> so I was like, would you like the floor? Good, good. Yeah. Sorry for the mistake on signal. No, thank you. Um, Michael, you have the floor. <clears throat> Boy, um, I had had some stuff in my head, and and since I got here very late, um, everybody who's said something has fed into um, the stuff I'm thinking and the, the interrelationships are, are kind of exploding out my ears. Um, I'm thinking about, um, uh, you know, the gatekeepers, Zettelkasten, shared informational linkage, um, uh, decentralization, um, the General Services Administration. Uh, um, it, it, I'm I'm really struck by um, the fact that almost everything that we want to happen is ironically. Um, you know, the things that we have to do together are ill served by the places that we gather um, and by the means we have to gather. And that as long as we're stuck, um, you know, getting together in an ephemeral Zoom call or getting together in a Facebook group or getting together on this, you know, this bulletin board, this live event, this, all, all these things that don't speak to each other and don't address the thing that Jerry, you were talking about. I mean, this, you know, if the information does get harvested, it gets stuck in the silo of your brain or the silo of, you know, somebody else's uh second brain or zettelkasten you know system or and and the means for us to be able to share them are kind of dependent on each of us having one of those and and being decentralized enough to be networking those not on some corporate owned space and not having to decide between a hundred different efforts to be the answer. Um, and, you know, I don't know where the General Services Administration or the uh, post office or, uh, you know, or, or any of the other more infrastructural, um, and, you know, I, I realize that's limited to this country, which is unacceptable, you know, but I, I mean, where is the, you know, the, the, the funny thing about, you know, looking to anything like the UN or any, anything that is the assembly of the hierarchically um, chosen representatives of the world is that that's the same problem. And, you know, it's interesting when we were first working on Factor, um, my, my former partner was, um, had come out of the UN and, you know, the, the, the notion of a, of a global social network sanctioned by the UN was something that was floated internally and met with absolute horror because the last thing that this, this organization born of the hierarchy wants to do is empower citizens to communicate it with each other directly and and you know and move things. Um, so I'm you know it's not going to come it's not going to come from on high, and uh, you know the borderless state that John talked about. Um, the, you know, self-sovereign identity that's kind of necessary for that. 
um, the disintermediation from gatekeepers. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just <laughs> overwhelmed by the desire to, um, to facilitate that in any way that I can and, you know, and give up, you know, what, what as a platform builder, you know, I've tried to do toward the idea of, of I to call it lowest common denominator interaction because I think it's the highest thing, um, but a way for um, individuals to control what they do in their second brain, their, their Zettelkasten system, share it, tentatively instead of um, tentatively and with control over who they're sharing it with instead of this um, constant corporate and social pressure now social pressure to present to the world as expected of you and to consume the feed as as expected of you and and kind of economically necessary for these corporate interests but rather to share very judiciously and um, and consciously and intentionally and consume only what is you have filtered based on on the trust that you have in different people um, and and their vetting um, and. you know, not, not be, not for, for nobody to have the freedom to put something in front of you that, that is going to be there to, um, to outrage you, um, which wouldn't happen if the individual had control. It happens because, you know, we are making ourselves victims to algorithms that work on that principle because they're supported by advertising. I, I do really, and maybe I'm having too much faith in, in individual human nature, but I do think that people would consume information very differently and with a different kind of skepticism if um, it was not being pushed at them and if they had to choose what they were pulling in. Um, so that was sort of a, a brain dump but um, it relates to stuff I'm actually doing and, and it was um, spurred in large part by um, you know, the particulars of what I just said by trying to get the things that people here were saying. I'm always glad even when I have to be really late that I show up here because I hear things that um, I'm, I'm glad to hear on their own and also you know, feed, feed what I'm thinking. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, I, th those are things that I'm scratching my head about as well. It's it's, it's all uh, there. There's just so much energy and cons and justified concern around the feeds that we're all drowning in, and what effect they have on society and decisions and politics and power and all that. That that whatever we can do to improve that is absolutely worth it. So, great stuff. Um, I'm going to check in really briefly. Uh, I am on the 25th. I'm heading out for a better part of two weeks uh, to first, I'm going to catch up with April in Madrid for less than 48 hours. Then I'm going to go to Bucharest and be part of Unfinished 2022. I'm speaking, I'm keynoting at the start, and then I'm going to have office hours basically in some corner of a courtyard that's apparently beautiful uh, with my brain and whatever anybody wants to come by and do. Uh, I urge anybody in OGM to register for the event, like the last couple of years, the, the event is free. Uh, they just want people to put in a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, energy into the <clears throat> into the mix. And I'm going to sort of dive more into the rest of the speakers in the event shortly. So I'm going to look, look at what they've got uh, and see what, you know, how that fits back into OGM. And I'll, I'll try to report back uh, there. And then uh, thanks to uh, Leif Edvinson and Hank, I'm going to go to Latvia and uh, join a business school conference where 
um, I people were wearing jackets from photos and I'm like, wait, does my jacket still fit? Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of in, in that state. I've got to figure out if my wardrobe is up to going to a business school. Uh, but other than that, I'm really looking forward to talking there. And they've, they've been very nice about fitting me into the program uh, in a couple of ways. And then I, I'll travel back, I think, on October 7th. Um, so, um, yeah, the city of Kaunas, which I hadn't heard of before and is having a cultural year or something like that. And it should be a lot of fun. So um, that also means that I may not be able to make a lot of my call commitments during those two weeks. Uh, in some cases, I may make them the way Grace is dropping in from a train and, uh, you know, going to Munich. Uh, but also that it opens up opportunities to do our calls a bit differently. So if anybody wants to suggest that or pick up some of those, that would be awesome. Um, and with that, uh, your daughter took half your jackets. Did she tell you about it or were they just missing, Grace? Um, that's very funny. Oh, good, good. So she she sought approval. That's, that's nice. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all for being here and um, wish you a happy rest of week. And I'll uh, see you all in the inner tubes. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Be kind. Thanks for being here. All the best. <laughs>